it's uh, it is a clarificatory question, but it's a very large and deep clarificatory question. So, um, so I think this might vary a little bit across perspectives. So there are some perspectives that I think can be summarized in, you know, can be encapsulated at least in propositions, um, and then, uh, but the way in which they work out, you know, is is much more uh, is open ended, right? So you might think like consequentialism. You know, uh, you might think that you can sort of, you can state that, that you can state the principle of consequentialism that, you know, what is right, you should do, what one should do is what maximizes the good, right? Um, and, but then what that actually means is, you know, an open-ended thing. So there's two aspects. So, so um, that reflection you were talking about, so, so perspectives can be more or less systematic. Um, and sort of principled. Um, at the limit, I think in the sort of ideal case, you might think, and I don't know, I think this should make sense to people. You could think about sort of a Carnapian explicitation where what, you're do, what you do is you make explicit the taxonomy you're employing and you know, the principles of value, what matters most to you. And that provides a principle for interpreting information as it comes in. Ideally, there's no in principle reason why you couldn't fully specify that, though typically it's tacit and we don't have any, we don't engage in that kind of reflection, but you know, in principle that could happen. That wouldn't get to the open-endedness, the fact that there's still information coming in, that that principle has to be applied to information as it comes in. However, you know, in a sort of Laplacean context, you can say, all right, give me all the information, apply the principles, and that gives me the full, right? We exhaust the open-endedness by feeding all the information we have into those principles, right? So in that kind of way, you could specify a perspective fully. You could exhaust the open-endedness uh, by, you know, um, uh, satiating it with information. Then still the thing that I care about is the implementation, right? The fact that it would have to, you could endorse that. I could say, ah, you know, here's my Carnapian Laplacian encyclopedia. This is the perspective I believe to be best, right? I could hold it up in this, you know, nice bound leather volume. Um, there's still a difference between that and it actually regulating my intention and uh, sort of generating these responses in me. And that's the thing I really want. Okay, so that, that seems like as much as I could say for now in the clarificatory sort of uh, whatever. Yeah. Okay, so Marta, should I go on and just say what I would say in the last section if I was going to say it, and then we can have an open ended conversation. Okay, so that was about format and then use and perspective and trying to exploit something about what I said about formats to explain about how there are different perspectival resources available in the two systems and the way in which you representational media and the ways in which those uh, make an aesthetic difference. The last thing, which is in a way the thing that I'm most curious about, but also makes people the most people like like really, you know, sort of um, grumble when I say it. And there's something really, I keep on saying things I don't really believe in their strictness when I say them. And so there's something I'm really trying to figure out here is something about the force with which the ways in which these two media, therefore, in virtue of the different ways in which they work, um, the, the way in which they have different kinds of force for the audience. Um, so the basically idea for me is that language encode natural language this is not something that's ubiquitous to language representational linguistic representational systems as such but natural language encodes speech act force so when i use a declarative i'm using a sentence that has as part of its char characteristic fun function conventionally has as part of its characteristic function to undertake a commitment i'm not just putting information out there i'm making a commitment of course, I can like merely pretend to do that. I can do that in order to do something else. There's all kinds of pragmatic exploitation. But there is speech act force, which is marked in language. And that is not true about pictures. Pictures do not conventionally mark speech act force. They just depict contents. And so it's not, and that that is important to me about how language works. Um, and I think it makes a difference to the way in, and by contrast, what pictures at least seem to do is bring, so the force in the case of sentences, in the case of language, comes at least in part through the fact that, like, I am at least making as if to say this thing, right? There's some kind of the assertoric force or, you know, imperatival force or whatever. <coughs> By contrast, 
with pictures. There's also this kind of compellingness, this kind of force, but I feel like it comes through the sense in which the picture makes it seem as if the scene itself is present, right? That is before one, brings to presence the content itself. And so um, there's a way in which uh, the kind of authority, the kind of, re and therefore the kind of res interpretive responsibility that, uh, so there's a kind of authority and interpretive responsibility that's involved in communication, even aesthetic sort of, uh, you know, sort of uh, interchange. And I think that that's distributed differently across the, in, in, across the audience, the vehicle and the producer in the two cases. And I feel like I want to say, I want to hopefully argue that um, in the case of the picture, it is the force comes from, it's as if you are directly there with the scene and it speaks for itself. And in the case of the sentences, it is as it is has it, the force flows instead, at least partly through the speaker testifying to this. But given all the ways in which there's pragmatic complexity of who can do what with what, and that is a very complicated thing to say. So, um, I, but I think a part of what going back, so now just to conclude, go back to this canard that I began with, a picture is worth a thousand words. Why do people say that? What are they up to when they say that? Well, one thing is just the thousand, right? The, the, the um, uh, you know, there's so many things in a picture as that you'd have to spell out separately in the case of language. Um, so there's abundance to the visual media that there isn't to the linguistic media. Um, linguistic media are curated and selected. They focus attention in a way that the pictures um, don't immediately do. Um, but there's also something about this worth. Like when people say a picture is worth a thousand words, it's like, you don't need me to tell you this thing. Look for yourself, right? The picture itself shows you this thing, right? It gives you, and that part of what they mean by that, I think, is it has this direct experiential impact in virtue of having the sensory uh, sort of uh, givenness, but also that there is a kind of impression, an appearance of unmediated, it's you and the scene, um, and the maker is sort of stepping, is merely a conduit and stepped off to the side. I think it's important that that is an appearance. It's something that's not necessarily true, but is I think part of what seems compelling about pictures. Okay, so I'm just gonna stop there so that we can have some discussion. <laughs>